Welcome to episode 69 of the Search with Candor podcast, recorded on Friday the 10th of July 2020. My name is Mark Williams-Cook, and today we're going to be talking about Google's domain expiry snafu. We're going to be talking about indexing low-quality pages in Google, and if that's still a thing. And we're going to be talking about their new schema testing tool that's replacing their structured data testing tool. I've also, at the end of the show, got a few SEO resources for you. If you haven't heard of them, you'll find them very, very useful indeed. It's a rather unfortunate situation we're going to start off with, which is Google forgot somehow to renew one of their blogspot domains, blogspot.in. So this leaves them essentially in the situation where they need to negotiate with the person that bought it to buy it back. And as the blog post on Little Warden goes further to you know point out, this isn't just Google, this has happened to. So I'll read out a snippet here of some previous cases. So uh, they've written here, a few weeks ago, the UK government forgot to renew a help to buy domain name, which was mentioned hundreds of times across documentation. So the UK government's sort of internal uh, links or external links in their own documentation. And it was instantly snapped up by someone and sold at auction for £40,000. And 2018, so the year before last now, Clydesdale Bank had to go to court against a cyber squatter to get control of an expired domain. Although they won the domain back, it cost months of time and hundreds of thousands of pounds in legal fees. Uh, 2017, Marketo, a company worth over a billion dollars, made headlines by forgetting to renew its domain. And he said, we can go on with further examples from Microsoft, Foursquare, Microsoft again, Dallas Cowboys, uh, Microsoft again, but we won't. The point here is, you know, these are all very big brands with very valuable domains that should know better. And if it's not something you've encountered with SEO, uh, within SEO before, it's actually a really quite, um, it's quite a mature market now. And that is the kind of monitoring and drop catching of these domains. So any domain that's been around for a while, that's attracted links, and those links have been there a while, has some latent value to it. And I'll link at the end to at the end of this podcast, and you can find it in the show notes, a link to uh, a particular a newsletter that's all about kind of buying and selling websites and building up websites and flipping them and making money from them. And one of the things um, a lot of people do when they start off in this endeavor is to actually buy domains with a backlink profile or domains with a history. So there's always been talk about what happens if you kind of buy a domain and it's got links and the domain expires, you know, do those do those links still count if you then kind of publish a completely new website? And I've certainly seen seen mixed messages on this from both Google and webmasters and personal experience. Um, what I've personally experienced is that, you know, if you if you do manage to buy a domain with a history and you can kind of resurrect it if it's expired with um, similar or very very similar or similar content then it will in my experience tend to rank a lot faster and a lot better than kind of a fresh out of the box domain with no links will certainly i know there are safeguards in place if you buy a domain that's in a particular topic or a niche and you try and publish something completely different that's probably not going to have the desired effect Um, Something else that I've seen uh, and I know people do is for people that run private blog networks. So that's people that are kind of controlling whole sets of websites um, where they control where the links go uh, for SEO purposes. I've certainly seen people buy expired domains and then they'll actually find the content that used to be on that domain through something like the web archive and just restore it. So it maybe looks like then to search engines that all that's happened is the domain 
accidentally expired and it maybe changed who was managing it but the old content was still there and there's no real way for a search engine to that I can see to practically protect against that because if you run some um, very feasible scenarios such as I own a website and you decide to buy it from me the who is the registration information will change and there's certainly no um, no reason for it to lose rankings just because the the owner of the domain has changed and in a similar vein you know if I own a website and I do let the domain expire um, so the site goes down for a little bit and then I'm like whoops you know and I, I I'm lucky enough where I've I can renew it without someone else grabbing it and it goes back up again there's no sort of logical reason from a search engine point of view for if if it can then get back to the content and the links still exist why necessarily it should rank a lot worse than it did before so with these two things combined if i did sell a domain and in the meantime it did expire briefly again you wouldn't expect a negative outcome from that and that externally is exactly the same as if a domain expires someone catches it and then they restore the content from an archive from an external point of view that looks like the same kind of situation which i'm guessing is why people are doing it for pbns and, and why it is working now there are services that already exist which um, are very fast to do what's called drop catching which is essentially to place bids and purchase domains very quickly after they uh, have expired so it's not something you can casually get into if it does interest you you're not going to be able to unless you're incredibly lucky it's very uh, very unlikely that you're going to see a valuable domain just expire and sit there waiting around for someone else to renew it it's especially the case that you'll see if ever you've tried to register a new website or a new business name um you know, pretty much every variation on .com domains are gone. Sort of all English words and uh, combinations of them are normally squatted by someone who has registered it for, you know, £10 or whatever, and then they're trying to resell it for a higher fee. Um, so that's a very well kind of established and old and, you know, old market. So um, I thought it's really interesting that this did happen to Google. Um, it's something to think about, I think, because it does sometimes fall between the cracks. I've seen it happen before as well where companies get websites made and there's this assumption unless it's spoken about unless and unless someone says you know we are taking responsibility for this sometimes the responsibility for actually who is renewing this domain name is it the web agency is it the IT team is it someone in marketing in-house sometimes falls through the cracks and that's obviously when it does happen absolutely devastating even though it's a thing that can only happen at most once a year depending on how long you register the domain for um, it's one of those things that can be very very expensive when it does happen uh, so little warden is actually a, a tool um, i've used before that one of the things it does monitor is domain name expiration i'll put a link to it in the show notes at search dot with so you can check it out um, and it might be worth if you haven't double checking when your domains are going to expire so if it can happen to them it can certainly happen to you that's what i got as a takeaway after reading about this situation where google have forgotten to renew one of their domain names for their blogspot low quality page indexing is something i would like to talk about so that is how difficult is it has it changed in difficulty to get quote unquote low quality pages indexed in Google and why you might want to do that? Um, I'm normally pretty good on this podcast in sticking to um, sticking to facts, sticking to evidence, sticking to data, sticking to what Google is saying or reporting. This you'll have to give me a little bit of leeway here because this is just something I've noticed in terms of I've heard and seen three or four different things which are leading me towards a conclusion which may be completely wrong. Um, you're welcome to, as always, tweet at me or whatever to say if you think I'm spewing BS. Um, it certainly happened before, but it's something I wanted to talk about because I, I find it quite interesting. And this stemmed from a few weeks ago it was quite 
publicly visible that Google was having some issues indexing new content. And this is actually something we've covered on this podcast, I think three times now. So once this year and twice in 2019, there were, you know, I'd say fairly large just in terms of the impact of webmasters noticing something was wrong, issues with how Google have been indexing content. And I was listening to the Google uh, Search Off The Record podcast, which I highly recommend. And you've got John, uh, Gary and Martin split on there. Um, I think they're like two episodes in now. Really interesting, kind of easily listening stuff. And one of the things that they spoke about on the last podcast they did was about this kind of outage, if you like, in terms of um, Google and crawling and indexing. And specifically, um, they were they went into a lot more detail about why this issue occurred than I've ever kind of heard them publicly talk about before. So Gary discussed that essentially, and I'm sure it's way more complicated than this, but for the layman, uh, what was happening was the crawlers were overwhelming indexing. So this means maybe Google, as I understand it, was kind of chucking too many URLs at the indexer and the indexer was not keeping up and it was creating a bottleneck which was creating this queue which was creating this ever increasing delay in new pages getting indexed. So fair enough that's that's what that issue is. At roughly the same time I noticed um, that also Gary had tweeted around saying something like um, you know, why is it people are surprised when their low quality pages are not being included in Google's index? Because as we all hopefully know, just because your page is crawled and discovered by Google, it does not necessarily mean it will be included in the index and it will be returned in subsequent searches by users. And as a third thing or third and fourth thing, I had noticed um, a colleague of mine and I had set up um, a couple of our little just for fun SEO experiments Um, don't always publish them um, because they're sort of not valid enough and don't have large enough data sets to be sort of mega interesting or stand up well to scrutiny but we like testing small things that are under our control and one of the things we were testing was just looking at how quickly we could get new pages equal pages discovered from links maybe that were from no indexed pages Um, whether the no index was on the page or in the HTTP header and whether that would happen at all. And we set up our experiments roughly the same, but there was one kind of key difference, which was the pages that he was trying to get indexed were roughly the same as the rest of his other pages on his site in that he had made them in the same template. They had a fair bit of content in them um, and they were just linked to kind of from the homepage. My experiment was a little bit different in that I had linked to these pages again from the homepage, but I had just written the HTML by hand in notepad and there was like two sentences on each page. So it was like a super thin page with pretty much no content on it. And we both ran our experiments and after like a few days, he messaged me and said, yeah, actually both of these pages got discovered and got indexed. And he was kind of like, how about yours? And when I checked, I was like, huh, neither of mine are indexed, not even the one that was kind of, uh, we were expecting to get indexed. And I left this for about another, I think it's four to five weeks. So um, these links have definitely been discovered because they're on the homepage, the site's changed since then, other stuff's got indexed. And I noticed that the pages never got indexed and I didn't look into it in a huge kind of depth. Um, I did check the logs and they had been crawled So I came to the conclusion that Google had decided, obviously because that it was very short, very different to the rest of the site, they probably weren't worth indexing, which is, again, really anecdotal, but something I had noticed hadn't happened before because I've done similar tests in the past where I've created these little kind of scrap pages and they get indexed. They don't particularly rank for anything, but they are there if I trigger a specific search. This wasn't the case this time. And the final strand connected to this was with some SEO client that we had been working with, we were looking at some of their competitor activity. And one of the things their competitor was doing 
being very careful here not to identify anyone. So this was an e-commerce website and they had taken a very aggressive approach to indexing or trying to get indexed um, filtered and faceted views of their product categories. So this means they would have their kind of product categories, their subcategories indexed in Google. However, all of their filters, such as um, these were a type of item that had a size and these were like everything, a type of item that had a price range, they were making indexable pages for every size and price combination. So it was, you know, item at this size under £20 and item range at this size under £50. And as you can imagine, there are literally thousands and thousands of different of combinations for these. And this technique had historically worked very well for them. Um, looking at the amount of search traffic they'd got, it kind of built up and it looked like some of those longer tail pages were getting, well, they were definitely indexed and it looked like they were getting uh, traffic, you know, not huge amounts, but that's the point. Each of those pages may be only getting sort of 10 visitors a month, but they were getting traffic. And I noticed at the kind of April, end of April, according to, because um, obviously I don't unfortunately have access to their analytics, but according to all of the external data sources I could get my hands on, like SEMrush, like Systrix, it looked like their site had taken a big nosedive and scratching a little bit below the, the surface there, it looked like it was just actually that these pages were dropping out of the index. So all of these things came together um, to bring me to the conclusion maybe that from this bug that Google's had with their crawler getting overwhelmed, um, the crawler overwhelmed the index with what Gary's kind of saying like, yeah, well, bad pages aren't going to make, you know, into the index, duh, with this experiment that I ran and with what I've seen, at least with these competitors, my guess is that Google is getting a little bit stricter in the type of pages that it wants in its index. Um, as you know, last episode, we covered the 2019 Google spam report where we said they were encountering something like 15 billion pages per day of spam. And this is going to go in line, I guess, with the amount of genuine content that is created on the web that's massively growing. Um, so I, I guess they're at the point where They've, there is enough of this really good content to go around. There's such a volume of it that it makes sense to reduce spam, to improve search quality that they raise what is the entry level into getting pages indexed. So I think it's worth bearing in mind um, if you are planning um, on doing a site and you're thinking about things like different filtered faceted pages or uh, maybe tag pages in, in WordPress, that kind of thing. I think it's worth really carefully considering what is still ranking in your competitors, what does add value to the user and whether you would like to land on that page and if it makes sense. Um, not sure if it's entirely a thing, it makes sense to me and the the things I'm seeing seem to go in line with that. So I'll let you make your own minds up about that one. Product. So Blogspot is a big online uh, blogging platform. I'm sure all of you have seen at least one website on it uh, that any user can sign up for. It's spread across multiple geographic top levels. The Google Rich Results Test is out of beta as announced on the 7th of July on the Google Webmaster blog. So they posted saying, today we're announcing that the Rich Results Test fully supports all Google Rich Result features and it's out of beta. In addition, we're preparing to deprecate the structured data testing tool, waving hand emoji. It will still be available for the time being, but going forward, we strongly recommend you use the rich results test to test and validate your structured data. And then Google goes on to say, rich results are experiences on Google search that go beyond the standard blue link. They're powered by structured data and can include carousels, images, or other non-textual elements. Over the last couple of years, we've developed the rich results test to help you test your structured data and preview your rich results. Here are some reasons the new tool will serve you better. One, it shows which search result feature enhancements are valid for your markup that you're providing. Two, it handles dynamically loaded structured data markup more effectively. 
Three, it renders both mobile and desktop versions of a result. And four, it is fully aligned with Search Console reports. You can use the uh, rich results test to test a code snippet or a URL to a page. The test returns errors and warnings we detect on your page. Note that errors disqualify your page from showing up as a rich result, while warnings might limit the appearance. Your page is still eligible for showing up as a rich result. And then they go on to give some examples of that. So that's no different to the structured data testing tool in terms of, you know, warnings mean um, it's not going to show and uh, sorry, errors mean it's not going to show and warnings mean you're still eligible. So that was the announcement that went out as well the same day on Twitter. It was not met with uh, rapturous applause by the SEO community to say the least. So the first reply that I can see in this thread is from Barry Adams, um, who replies to Google uh, Webmaster Central saying, this is awful. The STTT, so the Structured Data Testing Tool, is a tool that validates all schemas and helps make the web a semantically richer place. The rich results test only supports a tiny narrow subset of Google approved schemas. You're downgrading the web with this move. You're making the web worse. You, Google, had a chance here to use your vast resources to maintain and improve the existing structured data testing tool and help enrich the web. Instead, you retreat back into your own narrow little view of the web and do as you want to do. So say what you really feel, Barry. Um, so not well received by Barry. Uh, again, the next comment down, um, Ian Lurie says, uh, really, is this better? And he's got a, a search result, uh, a screenshot of a rich test result saying page not eligible for rich results known by this test. So both uh, Barry and Ian here are pointing out that this new rich results tool is ignoring the majority of, actu of, of schema that is kind of exists as the standard and is only testing for schema that Google currently provides special results for. Uh, Ian goes on to say, the new tool is painfully slow. The old tool showed a structured data result for the URL tested above. It provided useful feedback and supported industry-wide standardization. The truth is you're replacing a great structured data tool for an inferior Google-specific one. And I think that's been reflected um, in fairness with, that's the feedback a lot of webmasters are giving, which is that, you know, <laughs> there is more to the, the web than Google and their original structured data testing tool was helpful in that it could help us verify a uh, schema across the board. So not just things that um, Google is, is currently offering uh, features for. So while that's out of beta, I know people will be looking for some alternatives and I will talk to you about some alternatives in a second when I go through some extra SEO resources for you. Domains, and I read this week that basically Google forgot to renew their blogspot.in domain. And what happened here was that some- Okay, SEO resources. I put together a list of a few links um, based around what we were talking on, on the show today and just one or two other things, which I think are great if you don't know about them. So starting with what we were just talking about, so this um, schema validation, there's a couple of other options for you. So there's two websites and I will include all of these links in the show notes at search.withcanda.co.uk. So you can just go there, you'll be able to find the transcription for this podcast and you can just click on those links. So firstly, um, there is schemamarkup.net, which is a great online tool that will enable you to validate all of your schema, not just the Google um, rich result validated schema. And alongside that, there's another website um, called schema.dev, slightly different uh, schema.dev. It does offer a schema builder as well, um, and it's got a Chrome extension that goes with it. It's a really helpful set of tools to help you generate schema. So if you are going to miss the structured data testing tool, these are two things that I recommend you bookmark. Uh, we mentioned earlier, uh, right at the beginning of the show, when we were talking about um, domain name catching, domain name purchases, and I kind of got onto the subject of building, selling, flipping websites. Um, there's a resource at Richard 
patey.com, which again, I'll link to in the show notes. And Richard offers a free kind of newsletter about investing in websites and building them up. And there's a paid one as well. Well worth checking out if that's something you're interested in. Um, Two other resources I haven't covered today, but are absolutely brilliant. So Rob Kerry, um, I don't know how to introduce Rob really, um, if you don't know him. Um, he's definitely one of the best SEOs I've ever had the pleasure of meeting, although very briefly. Um, I've seen some of the work he's done over more than the last decade. Um, just take my word for it, check it out. He has started an e-commerce podcast, which you can find at the very nice URL of ecommerce.fm. Um, I think he's about seven or eight episodes in now. Um, it's brilliant. If you're involved in e-commerce, you're interested in e-commerce, go listen um, to that and subscribe. And lastly, uh, I, I guess a lot of people listening to this podcast will already know about this because she has over 5,000 subscribers to it. Uh, but Elena Solis runs an, uh, a newsletter for SEO, which I always say wrong in my head. And it's SEO FOMO. So SEO, F-O-M-O, which is search engine optimization, fear of missing out, I guess. Uh, if you just Google a later uh, SEO FOMO or probably just SEO FOMO, you'll find it. You can sign up. Um, a later sends out a weekly newsletter, kind of a roundup with links of all the stuff that's happened in SEO. It's one of the um, two newsletters I actually sign up for with SEO. So there's that one and I subscribe to TLDR Marketing. So Too Long Didn't Read Marketing. Both of these um, you can find just by Googling them and I'll put links in the show notes, but both give really fast kind of breakdowns, not huge uh, emails that take you ages to read. So highly recommend all of those resources. And that's everything I've got time for in this episode. I'll be back next Monday, which will be July the 20th. If you're having fun, please do subscribe to the podcast. As usual, you can get the transcription as well if you prefer reading at search.withcanda.co.uk. And I'll guess you'll hear from me in a week. Here at least to have a trademark for the term blogspot. So Little Warden did actually check the UK and US registrations for that. It means they don't have any automatic rights to that domain name.